Hello, everyone. Cliff Smith here. Um, welcome to the Middle East Forms webinar and podcast series. Today, I am hosting a special guest, Mindy Bells. Uh, Mindy work is with Globetrot, a weekly newsletter she writes devoted to news from around the world. Um, previously, for several decades, she was a senior editor at World Magazine, an evangelical Christian outlet with focus on world affairs. She has done on the ground reporting in Iraq, Syria, Sudan, Israel, and many other countries in the Middle East. Um, she is also the author of a book called um, They Say We Are Infidels on the Run from ISIS with Persecuted Christians in the Middle East. Um, I have read Mindy's writing and occasionally shared tips and learned from her for many years. Welcome, Mindy. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Cliff, for having me. Um, the thing we're going to talk about today, um, along whatever else comes up, is um, one place in particular you have spent a lot of time in your running around the globe is the Kurdish regions of Iraq and Syria. And you discuss um, a lot of that in your book. Um, um, they say we are infidels, um, which is largely born out of your experiences, um, mostly in Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, you've been to the region many times and you've continued to write about it. Um, so just in general terms, let's just start out. Um, you want to discuss your experiences in the region? Um, how many times have you visited? What are your impressions? How, mm. how they interact of their of that region? How they interact with their neighbors? Wherever you want to go with that. Well, sure. Well, um, I, I mean, I think most of us can remember that when the United States went to war in Iraq, um, now almost twenty years ago, um, that the Kurds were our first and foremost ally in in the the fight against the Saddam Hussein regime. And um, I actually went to Iraq for the first time a year before that war started. And I went um, th through, went in through the back door into Iraqi Kurdistan um, and, and with the help of Kurdish groups that were then headquartered in Damascus, headquartered in Washington, you know, kind of living um, uh, as they had to do under Saddam Hussein something of a of an exiled life and um but but we've watched as this region and and the kurdish people themselves have become a powerhouse in the middle east and and they have been throughout i would say you know in and let's just agree a very difficult region where almost all the territory is contested by terror groups by the iranian regime by corrupt politics um the Kurds have built themselves into sort of an economic and political powerhouse and a force to be contended with. And so I think what's, what is relevant right now, and, and you know, one of the reasons I think it's important that we're having this conversation is that this, um, this incredible protest movement that we're seeing emerge in Iran, it's now entering its second month. No one thought that, you know, friends, and um, supporters of an Iranian Kurdish student, Masamini, who was killed in late September. No one thought that this, um, well, actually she was killed in, in early September. No one thought this movement would, would grow as it has and that it would come to be focused in some ways on the Kurdish people who are spread from Iran through Iraq and into Syria. So I think it just brings out a lot of the di dynamics that we watch develop in this region and particularly draws attention again to the Kurdish people. Yeah, you actually kind of preempted my next question there insofar as I was going to ask. Um, it was the murder of Masha Amini um, in Iran that set off these protests. How much do you, so you kind of alluded to, but how much of this is focused on the fact that she was Kurdish? Because then clearly the protests are far beyond just Iranian Kurds. Um, how does the fact that she was Kurdish play into this in your view? Well, a lot of the, um, I mean, not all, but a lot of the uh, sort of fuel for the protest fire, I would say, has come from um, Kurdish groups inside of Iran. And um, they have long been persecuted. They have long been sort of on the outskirts of both the economic and the um, political life of Iran, but, but you know, keep in mind that everyone in Iran has suffered tremendously under, um, under the regime and under the sanctions that have come as a result of the re regime's policies. And so um, 
this, this, the way in which she was brutalized um, by police forces and, and killed and, uh, you know, and then, and then the Iranian government's um, kind of tossing that off and making excuses for what happened to her while she was in custody. The fact that she was um, arrested for not simply, I, I mean, it wasn't even that she wasn't wearing the hijab. She, there, her hair was showing, you know? Um, and so, so all of it has provoked understandable outrage, but it has also revealed sort of this, um, the fact that the Iranian people have lived so much under the thumb of the regime in a way that we don't often appreciate because, because they are Muslim people. And so we don't appreciate the um, degree, especially in the West, the degree to which this Islamic extremist regime persecutes its own people, persecutes Muslims as well as Christians and, and other groups. Mm -hmm. How do you think the, the events in Iran are being viewed by the Kurds in Syria, Iraq, Turkey, so on? Well, I, I think that it has been like not on our radar, at least in the media so much that um, that Iran very quickly unleashed a barrage of attacks when, when the protests deepened, became very entrenched, um, somewhat I would say out of hand. I mean, if you look at the footage, you can see that you have, you have girls, you have students, you have now university uprisings that, that are deepening the protest movement inside Iran. As that happened, I mean, it became clear to the Iranian regime they were getting support from outside, and they began attacking um, Kurdish areas in Syria and Iraq. And in particular, um, and we got several reports. I mean, they they and the Iran has now admitted they fired seventy three surface to air, uh, no, I'm sorry, surface to surface missiles at Kurdish groups in inside Iraq. So so in a sense widening the conflict through their own choice and, and bringing all the Kurdish people into this protest movement. Um, the, the attacks in Iraq, I mean, what you have to understand, it comes back to how the Kurds have sort of become a force to be reckoned with across this region and have become a force for openness and democracy, not perfectly, not without corruption and problems. Um, but have really become a force for freedom, both inside Iraq, inside Northeast Syria, and inside Northern Iran. And so when Iran launched these 73 surface to air missiles, surface to surface missiles, it's very ironic that there was, there was sort of a Congress of medical people from throughout the region that was gathering outside of Erbil in the town of Koya. Koya is this, you know, university town, it, it, it's, it's considered kind of a cultural center. Um, it's a lovely, lovely area of Iraqi Kurdistan. I mean, like a barrage, dozens and dozens of missiles um, were fired there in late September. And I believe nine people were killed, including a mother who was pregnant and, and her baby was killed. She baby was delivered and, and, and was also dead. Um, so, and people, there were images of people this, this Congress of medical people, instead of meeting to discuss how to spread um, medical care throughout the region, they ended up being at the hospital next door, taking care of the wounded. And, and you had hundreds of uh, Iraqi Kurds inside um, and Iranian Kurds living inside Iraq who were having to take cover underneath rocks and, and underground shelters in Iraq. So, um, all of that, a picture of Iran sort of deciding to widen a conflict that it can't seem to bring under control itself in, in its own country. How, so, you, and you alluded to this um, when you discussed um, your time visiting Kurdistan in the early 90s. You know, after that, the Kurdish regional government in Iraq was formed and um, it has, you know, some autonomy. How has it reacted, if at all, to this attack that is? Yeah, I mean, obviously they they protested the the dropping of missile. I mean, keep in mind that you know the last couple of years we've seen this region become um, notable for barrages of missiles. If you remember, after the United States killed General Soleimani in in a in a strike in Baghdad, that um, 
Iran responded by attacking US air base and other targets in Northern Iraq, the same region. And so I think the Kurdish government has tried to, um, tried to not escalate the conflict, but has also protested. I would just put it that way. Mm -hmm. And, um, okay. Um, how does the, uh, let me go to the next issue that might kind of boomerang back to this, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, Turkey has of course also long had uh, issues with its Kurdish minority. Um, however, um, since Northeast Syria has become governed by the Syrian Democratic Council, a semi-autonomous region, mm -hmm. kind of like um, Kurdish regional government in Iraq during the Syrian civil war, um, that's become a much bigger issue and Turkey has made numerous excursions into Northeast Syria. So it's no longer just domestic, it's also international. Um, and it's sort of an open secret in DC that the Turks have quite openly sought support for a full out invasion of Northeast Syria, creating what they call a buffer zone. Um, do you want to talk about how these things play out? What are Turkey's goals? Um, how does the SDC respond to it? Do you have, you have any thoughts on these kinds of things? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, these uh, sort of low level warfare, I would call it, have, have been somewhat self contained. You've had um, the situation for the Kurds in Syria that's somewhat different from the situation of the Kurds in Iraq and different from the Kurds in Iran. What we're seeing right now through the Iranian attacks on the Kurds as a whole is that that the conflict is being widened mm -hmm. and and that is in the context of a region that both the united states and russia have a strategic interest in and and playing out on a geopolitical field that you know where we now are in quite a big war um, with the threat of nuclear escalation in Ukraine. I, I mean, all of these things are related. Mm -hmm. And so um, the Turkey moved into Northeast Syria at a time when the US and Russia were sort of contesting over how this war in Syria would be brought to a close. And in fact, it's been a standoff. The, mm -hmm. the war has not over. And, um, and in Northeast Syria, there is in particular, again, a Kurdish led, very stable government mm -hmm. with a Kurdish led, um, broadly democratic military force that includes uh, also Christian militias, Yazidi warriors, um, it, you know, and, and some Arab fighters as well. Turkey is using the context of, of the, the PKK group that has, you know, a terrorist past, using the pretext of the PKK being part of this widely democratic uh, group as for coming across the border, trying to create this buffer zone. And in fact, they occupy uh, a region, you know, at 30 and 40 miles uh, somewhere inside the border of um, Syria. And this is something that, you know, you have to say, NATO is just kind of, I mean, Turkey is a member of NATO. They have crossed a border into another country or occupying territory. That, that's against the NATO charter. And NATO has just been sort of looking the other way since 2018, 2019, when this began. And now it has very strategic ramifications because if Iran wants to continue to prosecute attacks on Kurds, that is going to bring in these wider forces and you're going to have to either Turkey and Iran conspire somehow to attack the Kurds, which is a big problem for us in the West, or they're going to be competing as they attack them. And, and you know, for so long, the United States was basically the patron of the Kurds. And, and we all know that it was, it was in some ways, um, the sell by data passed on the US uh, being at war in Iraq. But the fact that we've had these these debates and you know, troops have been pulled, troops have been left in. We, we definitely have uh, special forces in the region who are activated at times when we feel like our interests are threatened. Um, you've had, you had US special forces very involved in a terror led attack on uh, prison in um, 
Northeast Syria. And, and these terror led attacks are all, you know, standing behind them is Turkey. And um, at some point, this is going to blow up into a wider conflict again, I think is, is what we're looking at and why it's really important to pay attention what, to what happens to the Kurds. Mm -hmm. Uh, that that you alluded to this, but how does you know Donald Trump um, quite famously pulled U.S. troops out of parts of Northeast Syria, um, and that was very controversial even within his own administration. Um, do you want to speak to how that decision has shaped events in the last couple of years? Yeah, and I think most dramatically because I, I was I was there right in Syria right around the time that happened. And then it came back again because, because of the way the Turks had invaded Northeast Syria, they forced thousands of people from their homes as a result of that. And those, those people continue to be living in displacement camps in Syria, you know, and, and it, was, um, it was such a confusing and chaotic move. Uh, Trump on, on a Sunday night communicate, you know, issued a statement from the White House saying that he was pulling back in order that Turkey might move in. And, um, and, and we didn't end up pulling as many soldiers as he had first communicated. And that, I mean, there was a point when I was there, you could literally see the US forces crisscrossing the region in part because they didn't know where they were supposed to be. Um, and ultimately it was a lot of pain and no gain. What it did most dramatically is it, it really kind of sealed the deal on trust between the Kurds and the United States and, and, and between these um, governing authorities in Northern Iraq and Northeast Syria um, and across the region because the United States just, be, it, it became so clear that the United States was treating this area as a football that they could toss whichever way they wanted to and was very unclear itself about what the U.S. role and what U.S. presence was going to look like. At this point, I think that military commanders on the ground um, with CENTCOM have worked very hard to kind of restore some of the trust and to, on a local kind of um, very much under the radar way, try to shore up the U.S. role in the region and try to support these um, military forces that we have been allied with now for two decades. Uh, and that's worked to some degree, but, but it's, uh, it's created a very much of an atmosphere of distrust of political um, leaders in, in the U.S. And that, you know, let's be fair, that began with Obama. Uh, in, in, I mean, that began with Bush, if we want to go back to some degree, but it increased with Obama. It multiplied exponentially under Trump. And I don't know that Biden has even paid enough attention to some of these things for it to change at the political level. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, I'm going to ask another question or two, and then we'll get to audience questions. We already have quite a few up here, but if you are um, 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 interested in asking questions, please uh, type it in the Q&A box and hope we'll get to as many as possible. Um, <clears throat> specifically, since you've written about it, um, indigenous Christian populations um, of Iraq and Syria have generally found the most hospitable um, regions of the wider region to be Kurdish controlled areas of Iraq and Syria. Do you want to describe a little bit of the relationship between you know the majority Muslim Kurds and their Christian neighbors? It's something you've obviously thought deeply about. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's, it's one of, I would say, um, I'm trying to think of a, a good, uh, a good way to kind of shorthand way to describe it. There's definitely some friction there. Um, but there also is a recognition that, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you are a Christian living in Iran or in Iraq, um, Iraq is where I've spent the most time. If you're a Christian living in that region, uh, you have to choose patrons or protectors, I would say, from a lot of bad actors. Mm -hmm. And so are you going to choose a Muslim majority that often accommodates terror groups that want to see you beheaded? Or are you going to um, uh, be more comfortable with Kurds who have broadly and vocally supported democratic values 
uh, even though some of those elements are extremist, even though some of those elements are corrupt and have and have in some cases, you know, in localized cases, uh, I see this happening where, you know, these Christian communities that were all threatened and many of them emptied under ISIS, if you remember, starting back in 2014, sure. um, 300,000 Iraqi Christians forced out of their homes, forced out of Nineveh Plain. Where did they find refuge? They found refuge in Iraqi Kurdistan. And, um, and most of them are still there. Their churches are there, their, church, their, their clergy has relocated. Um, the, you know, until recently we saw a few churches reopen in Mosul and, and the, the clergy is back there in Mosul, but for the most part, they still live in Iraqi Kurdistan. They simply can visit uh, because security just has not returned to those regions. So it's an uneasy, uh, truce, a, an uneasy peace, I guess I would say, between those groups. And, and definitely, uh, with the exception of a few pockets, you know, the Kurds have been open to, I, I visited churches in Erbil, the capital of Iraqi Kurdistan, churches where 2,000 people might show up for a mass, a Chaldean mass, churches where hundreds of people are forced to be outside uh, you know, with the doors open. I mean, I mean, really kind of mega church type um, events. And, and, and the security for those will be the, the Kurdish um, uh, Peshmerga standing in a street corner, directing traffic, that kind of thing. Very different feel than you would get in other parts of Iraq or other parts of Iran. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll get to audience questions. Um, we have quite a few. Um, we'll get to as many as we can. Um, this is from um, Rabbi Joel Schwartzman. Um, who is arming the Kurds in any of these countries? Are the Russians and U.S. not keeping Turkey from invading and annexing large um, swaths of northern Syria? Question. Yeah, I would say that there is a there's an uneasy jockeying there. The the United States is trying to, I think, continue to keep Turkey in the NATO fold, and so they don't want to just. Um, jeopardize that by creating like an open conflict that pits U.S. forces against uh, a NATO partner, against Turkey directly. So you see a lot of sort of proxy things. And that gets to some of the other questions I see here where the United States is definitely supporting um, Kurdish forces. And we had so much to do with the buildup of Kurdish forces during the years of the Iraq war. Um, but those, those forces now operate on their own to a large degree. Um, they will still receive you know, military aid and, and other aid that the United States provides to a lot of countries that are considered our allies. Um, but, but not to, these forces are standing on their own and they operate on their own, they train on their own, they have their own commanding structure. Northeast Syria is a little bit different where I think you, you know, those, the, the um, YPG forces that are operating in Northeast Syria have grown up as militias that were fighting ISIS. And there may be just second gen, whereas in Iraq, they're more third and fourth generation. And, and so they still operate very much more of a, um, that kind of structure. And they do cooperate a lot with um, the U.S. forces that are in the region, but but U.S. forces are keeping very much of a support role, and again, managing this very delicate, dicey situation where you have Russian forces that are still there, and where you have Syrian forces that are. I, I mean, if you go to Kamishli in northeast Syria, there's there's a, a part of the city, and I stayed in a hotel not far away from there, and it's very tense, and you'll have. Uh, you can see the Syrian checkpoint, the uh, YPG Kurdish checkpoint, and then there are Russian forces and U.S. forces right there in that mix too. So it, it's it's a very tense place. Yeah, you can imagine just by saying those few words there and about who's standing where. Um, next question is from Hal Tar. Um, I'll paraphrase this a little. Basically, he's asking um, Turkey. Sweden and Finland made promises, some of which are not actually public, from what I understand, to mm -hmm. Turkey. Um, and Turkey is concerned that Sweden and Finland are too close to the Kurds, which is what they initially said they were, and are still occasionally threatening 
to veto their NATO membership. Um, how has that affected the Kurds as a whole? Yeah, I mean, it's helpful to understand a little bit background there, I think, because of the way that the Kurds were persecuted under Saddam Hussein, because of the way that they have been persecuted in Iran and the effects that we're seeing very directly of that right now. Um, you have a Kurdish diaspora that extends across Europe into the United States. You know, we have a large Kurdish population in the U.S., um, and, and also in these Scandinavian countries that took them in starting in the 90s and with the first Gulf War and continuing on through. And so it is, it is the basis of that that has made these countries um, very open to their Kurdish populations and somewhat protective of them. Turkey under President Erdogan is simply using that as a way to kind of blackmail them. This is how the Erdogan regime operates. And so um, they kind of are asking Finland and Sweden to, to do their dirty work for them as a, as a way of, um, of, of co-op, you know, as a way of, of saying, we'll check off the boxes for you to join NATO if you do this dirty work for us regarding the Kurds. And again, it's an uneasy negotiation, but I mean, to my knowledge, they have not stepped in and stopped it because they've been warned not to do that. Um, but, but I think that there, there is continuing to be this jockeying for power and for concessions from Finland and, and Sweden. And I think what we wanna watch for, this is gonna happen when it comes to Ukraine as well, what we want to watch for just kind of the the ways around the edges that we see the Kurds are being co-opted because people have had to make side deals to accommodate Turkey, to accommodate the negotiations with Moscow, that kind of thing. That's what we want to watch for these. And it's not only the Kurds, it's other minority groups who can suffer because they simply, they don't have their own country. They don't have their own representatives at the UN level and things like that. And so, and, and, and so they're constantly gonna be on their heels a little bit apart from support from Western nations. Mm -hmm. um, gonna get to one or two more here before we have to go. Uh, Larry Greenberg says, an Assyrian friend in the US tells me that even in autonomous Iraqi Kurdistan, even in Erbil, Assyrians are persecuted, property confiscated, etc." Do you want to speak to how that kind of thing plays out? Yes, and, the, and those things do happen. And, and one of the things I started to say earlier, and I just, I think my, my thoughts were going in too many directions. One of the things I've noticed, um, you see it a lot in Northeast Syria because, because the Kurds were the ones who sort of stood up these YPG forces. They successfully fought back ISIS from towns that had large Kurdish populations, but also historically were Christian towns. After they helped to defeat ISIS, this would be in the 2015, 2017, 2018 time period. They began using Kurdish names for these towns and, and, and they had historic Christian towns. Ain Isa would be one example, um, but other areas are much smaller. This is, this is a rural society that is still very agrarian in a lot of ways. And I began noticing as I was traveling across the region that I would use the, Assyri the ancient Assyrian names for a town and someone would correct me with a Kurdish name. And it's become very much of a, a political battle fought at the local level. And I think this is a very difficult question. I think if Western powers, Western groups, if you saw Western aid in this region, like we've seen in Northern Iraq, if you saw um, uh, the United States being a good supportive actor of democracy in these regions, that we would be able to bring these groups to the table and say, look, you know, an ancient historic town that has had a name for a Christian name for uh, not even centuries, but for millennia, ought to be able to keep that name. In other words, these seem like third and fourth tier problems that ought to be able to be negotiated, I believe, with, um, with some outside help. And, and that simply hasn't happened because you've had so many other major things happening in this region. 
that the United States and others are just like, we don't care what you call the town. Um, we just wanna be sure that ISIS isn't controlling it. And, and that's long-term, that's not a good solution. Long-term that is gonna lead to, and it is leading to increasing conflicts among Assyrian groups, the ancient Christian groups of the region and the Kurdish groups. Uh, my own one, maybe two more. Um, several people have asked, what is the relationship between the different Kurdish groups you've mentioned and Israel and uh, how they interact in some of this? Yeah, big question. How are you yeah. going to that? that would be interesting. Yeah, I, I might just kind of punt and say it's uneasy. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, it's interesting because the Kurds and Israel, if you think about it, have a lot in common. Um, the Kurds have for centuries uh, called for their own nation. And, they, and that's never, you know, they will often be called one of the largest people groups with the out of country in the world. Um, and, and that reminds you of the history of Israel. Uh, but I also, I think that they are, they have been at loggerheads too, because the Kurds are historically a Muslim group. And, um, and that has put them at odds with some of the interests of Israel. That's, that's uh, very much of a summary statement, but kind of how I would um, put that. Okay. Uh, I would love to ask more questions and there's a whole bunch more to answer, but unfortunately we are out of time. Uh, really appreciate talking to you about this and everybody else. Please join us next week for more webinars and podcast series. And uh, thanks for being here. Thanks, Mindy. Thank you, Cliff.